But see, I remember that I wanted to be the day, the longest day in the year, which is the 21st of June, as an endless day for her. It's related to time, the whole thing. And, and really, since it is the first day of the summer, and he makes a mistake by saying, let the flow and Ceres, it came like this. But Cleo de Saint Cassette is a title which has a kind of side thing, you know, the Saint Cassette in France, in French, is like afternoon love meetings. Uh -huh. Saint Cassette is something very daring, you know. And Cleo <coughs> was the name of a famous Claude Merod was a famous Poul de Luxe, as they said at the time, not Poul de Luxe, Cocotte de Luxe. There were these women around the 1900, 1900, who had been very famous. You know, they were loved by rich men who paid for them, you know, a house and horses and carriages. And it was like flirting with something light about Cleo, the Saint Gasset as if it were a love rendezvous or something, when it is fear and waiting for a doctor rendezvous, which has nothing sexy about it. <laughs> so it just came clear, came fine to me. I don't know more about the name than that. Because the film is not from 5 to 7, but from 5 to 6.30. <laughs> and that's why I say that the five to seven thing is, is a kind of joke. Because I didn't want to do a two hours film. Too long. <laughs> it's too long because when you have fragile films, you know, I think it's fragile to tell nothing, you know. To just, we know she waits for something, she spends some time, and plus playing the thing about real time and real geography. You noticed, for those who know Paris, or anything, it's, <laughs> it's like, you know, there was a film that I learned later called High Noon, which is also happening between 10.30 a.m. and noon, in a way real time, but it's not real geography, it means in the same time you are 10.30 or there, 10.45 elsewhere, 11 elsewhere. Is I wanted to follow Cleo and have the real, uh, I say geography or steps or whatever. If there are six steps, she, she walks, walks up six steps. Uh, in cinema, we have codes, like we have in literature and anything, that if somebody opens a door to go out, opens a door to go out, and then opens another door, you, are, you accept that there was a trip in between. We jump time all the time, you know, we skip, if it has stairs, you know, like three floors. You see somebody go up and then enter. We don't never do the whole thing. So, in that one, it was, come on, dear Paris. Uh, Paris. No. Quoi? A Paris. Un Paris. It's like giving yourself something difficult to achieve, but I can't remember now the, the word. That we won't cheat with the seven steps. If there are seven steps, if the, she has to go through uh, the patio to go to her house, or when she takes the taxi, Rue de Rivoli, and she goes to Rue Vigans, which is at the Metro Vapin, it's the real, the real way, the real streets, the, real, the whole way. The whole distance is not cheated. So uh, I, I had in mind really to, to make precisely the time and it was difficult, like, you know, you cannot cheat with to see a, a clock in the street which says 5.20. Okay, it's 5.20 in the screenplay, we do it. But then it has to be exactly 5.20 in the film. Imagine that it starts at 5, it has to be 20 minutes after the beginning of the film. Yeah. So sometimes it was difficult to adjust because we couldn't always change everything. So sometimes I took a little security by saying, 5.20 on the clock, and then 5.24 on the clock, or, so that if I had to adjust, so that in a way, I didn't want to have mistakes in the real time between 5 and 6.30, that's why the bells are the half hour. Um, 
The main the best thing. Place, it could be any half hour, maybe, because it's always. Oh, the, the bells, yes, but the clocks in the streets are in the places. Uh, you cannot, you know, five twenty is not six twenty. You know, it's, it's precisely the hour is precise, and that was. It became like difficult. I, uh, the word I looked for was challenge. It's like a challenge, right? Because difficult. It was funny and difficult to to catch that never cheat. Now, what I wanted is not only to mark the time, but also to make a difference between the chapters. And I guess it shows that it's a little like in Henry James. Uh, the name in the chapter indicates the style of the chapter. When it's her companion, maid, whatever you call Angèle. Angèle is a very realistic woman, you know, very much into good hands, realistic things. And the whole sequences about her are shot with a lens, like 35, quite open, quite sharp, quite precise, and realistic, I would say. Let's say the chapter about her lover, I don't remember his name. Dans, dans, dans le film, José? Oui, dans le film. José, c'est pas José? José. Oui. José. José, since he comes, this is the, the supposedly, you know, lovely Claude Merod business the meeting in the afternoon. I use a very long lens. It's very suave, you know, she moves like this, like in an aquarium. She makes faces and furs and feathers and he makes manners, you know, it's supposed to be like a bit de galanterie. And, and I change lenses and I change the way of telling the story, even though the time goes on specifically, not, not cheating with that. There were different approaches to film her. Or it's not exactly seen by Angel or seen by Antoine, but let's say that José is dominant the chapter. So is Angel is the key of the chapter. And later on, when she meets Antoine, is the key of the story. And then they are together. The only chapter with two persons is the last one. Since we can imagine they are together for that time. Both in danger, I would say. But at the time, you know, when I was asked to make a film for that producer, I had a beautiful project happening in set in Venice, color. I mean, a very important project. He started to sign the thing, and then he said, it's too complicated, it's too, uh, too, too expensive, too complicated. Make a film, 30 million, not more. So I started to think, how can I make a cheap film? Then we have to go, like, cheap is, you, you make it in a short time story, because it's more easy to, to make a film in one day than in, you know, above months or long, half years. Then I thought it should be in the same city so we don't have trips and things. Most of the technicians are in Paris. If we do it in Paris, they pay less expenses to people. So I went like this by just thinking about what I could I do to make a cheap film. Then I thought, if I make a very short time, she can have two, three dresses, but not 40. <laughs> and, and, and then I thought, and then I had in mind, if I shoot in Paris, I mean, what is dominating my feelings about Paris? It's fear. You know, I, I came from a country in a way, a country, city, and I'm not a Parisian, and I felt that it's a city to be, to be afraid of, afraid of loneliness, afraid of so many people, and so fear. The fear of what? And at that time, it was fear of cancer. Later, it was fear of nuclear, like it had been then, fear of AIDS. And now it's fear of poison or whatever. So, is it fear of cancer. And so, so, so sometimes people ask me, does it come from an experiment that you had, like you had been sick one day and you were afraid to have a cancer? I say, no, 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 it, it came, the beginning very reasonably like this. She, Paris, fear, etc. little by little. And then, and then I remember a, something I liked, a novel by Diderot, you know, writer, Jacques Le Fataliste, I don't know if you ever saw, read that. And it's a, he, he goes with his servant in a way, and then they make a trip traveling. And when they stop, like in, in a, I don't know, 
It's not an hotel, a hotel of that time. There are other people telling stories, side stories. And in the story, there are like little side stories. And I want the <coughs> maid to be like this. That's why when they go in the cafe, you hear a story of a man about his wife, a couple, make a little discussion. So little impression coming from other things. But the main thing is, she waits for a result of a medical exam. <coughs> She's absolutely afraid to, to have sickness called cancer. So when I told the story to the producer, he said, don't name cancer. It support malheur. It brings bad, bad, bad luck. luck. Bad luck. <coughs> so well, I, I cannot say that she has a flu. And he <laughs> said, OK, I allow you to name it once. You know, okay, fine, once. So that's in the garden, she sees when she's with the soldier. One point he said, afraid, she's afraid of everything and she said, cancer. Okay. So I named it only once. But you know, that's the only pressure he had on me. He was afraid that if we spoke about illness all the time, that he would turn the people off or something. So I didn't listen too much about that because he didn't care about the time, the story, he didn't care about anything. Never came to the dailies, never asked me anything, and came. He came when the film was totally finished, edited. That was my relationship with that producer. He sat and he said, in French, I said, c'est moins en que je croyais que ça allait. <laughs> you know, it's let's see it that I thought it would be. But for me. So that's all we had. And then the film was selected for Cannes Film Festival. It did very well. So uh, I didn't care too much about what he was saying, to tell the truth. But I accepted to name the word cancer and leave words. So the thing was to, to have real time. It's the same kind of problem that vagabond, you know, you kind of bore the people. I guess you weren't bored? Was no. Just, no. Because, but then we can also say nothing is happening. She's just waiting. At least one hour, 15, waiting until she meets the doctor. And then I wanted to establish that she was a kind of, she was a coquette, she's a coquette. But the main point, I don't know if it shows, is the film is one hour and a half. And there is a big change at 45 minutes, exactly in the middle of the film. All the first part, she's looked at. She's passive, she's described by the way people look at her. And the way her maid looks at her, the people in the street, the woman who sells a hat, recognizes her, um, even when she sings with her group. I mean, she's, she's kind of beauty, she's a star. She's looked at. She's used to describe and to find herself, to feel herself as seen, loved, or admired, or described by the others. Now, when she suddenly gets wakes up of something. Because she sings a song which is too much for her, she understands that she's in a fear that they cannot share. She, she breaks something. She gets rid of that déshabillé, whatever you call that, so do you She gets rid of her wig, and she goes out with a little dress like this, with just a little something and a stupid hat that finally she throws away. From that time, she's the one who looks at things. And from that time, she looks at the people in the street, the one who swallow and swallow the frogs and vomit them, and the other one who does that. And she looks at shops, and she looks at herself with a ridiculous hat. And, and she looks at her friend being exposed naked as a model. And she can see that the artist looks through the body of that woman. They don't look at her as a as a body, but as something they need to, de to make a design, to make a piece of art. And she looks at everything in the street. And I really, when I did it, I did it as a metaphor of feminism. Even though the film looks very feminine from the beginning to the end, for me, it's a very feminist reflection of thoughts that the day women started to look from, for themselves, to other people, to other things, to landscape, to street, to events, when they're not 
uh, organizing themselves through the look at the other on them, especially beautiful women. In that case, beauty is a handicap, is very difficult, more difficult, I guess, for being different. From that minute, 45 minutes, she looks at things, and already she's changing. Something is changing. And I really believe that the day before, if she had met that soldier, she would not have spoken to him. She would have thought, you know, like, well, one, of, one more wants to get me, or say, uh oh, would you want us day, or something like this. Like the stupid man on the bridge who says, vous habitez chez vos parents? You know, the classical thing. Do you live at your parents' or? You know, the kind of stupid things sometimes are just like this to start some conversation. Another day, she wouldn't have not been able, I guess, to just listen to him like a normal thing, to listen to somebody else. So for me, it's very important what happens to her, that the fear wakes something in her. And big emotions are very good start for changing mind, changing attitude not especially fear of cancer or any kind of strong emotion. And because she starts to look at things, she can look at that man and understand his own fear, being in a stupid war, obliged to go back to the war. And they share something which is, I mean, two lonely, two lonely experiences that can be together for that specific short time. <coughs> and then the feeling about short and big and short and long is what is leading the whole film for me. Like, I would say, objective time and subjective time, if it makes sense. And objective is the clock. is 5.10, 5.30, 6, 6.10. But subjective time is what we all feel, you know. When you wait something, it's very long. If you're speaking with friends, the same five minutes go by in a minute. And I wanted to feel time doing like this suddenly expanding and being suddenly narrow, expanding. So they can see in the same time, we are so little time, she said, on the bench. And two minutes after, she said, we all we have time. Because that's what we feel. We don't feel time as a reality. We see it as a reality, but we feel it like we feel, with totally different approaches to the sensation. Feeling is sensation. 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 The wonderful film within the film uh, includes quotations from at least half a dozen French, major French films from the canon, from the Lumière brothers. To you speak about a little film that you see in the yes, book? Yes, Yeah, seen. well, I wanted to tell you, it was very clear in my mind. I was so afraid that people get bored in that film. <laughs> <laughs> that I thought, and it's a classical rule that we all know that let's say, at the end of the third quarter, or maybe the beginning of the sixth, five or sixth, sixième, something at the end of the film, approaching the last part, there is always a kind of something like this, falling down. You get used to the story, you get used to the characters, you, get a, you know what will happen, or you think, or you imagine. So, I thought I should do something to wake them up now, in case they get bored. And I thought a very nice friend, Dorothy. I imagine she was a girlfriend of a booth projectionist, you know. And she would help by getting him a print or picking a print, I don't remember. She picks a print at Montparnasse, right? Or she brings a print, I don't know. <coughs> But then, so they would tell him, oh, look at the booth. Obviously, I made that little burlesque film. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, yeah. Well, the little film, again, is a metaphor for two things. One is that I was very friendly, and Jacques Demy and me were very friendly with Jean-Luc Godard and Anna Karina at the time. And I love and loved and love his eyes. He has a beautiful look. But at the time, he was using dark black, black glasses. <laughs> little by little, he became aware of that, and now, later, he used glasses, but you know, you can see his eyes. At the time, you couldn't. And I was getting so mad discussing with him. Come on, get rid of these stupid glasses, and nobody can see you. I mean, are you hiding or what? And I thought, mm -mm, I get him. I make a story in which, because of his black glasses, he sees nothing, and 
he thinks that she's dead or something, and he will be obliged to get them out. Off. So he got them off. Have you seen how he looks like Harry Langdon or something? <laughs> beautiful, silent actor, no? Don't he look beautiful? <laughs> so I got him to get his glasses away of his face. The other thing is, could be a metaphor that because of something you don't see, and oh, because of something you can see better. Vaguely, vaguely. Did the reference, direct reference to the Lumiere brothers and uh, no. René Claire? To what? Entre, entre act. Never saw no. it. <laughs> Not even so, now. So, uh, the, uh, the Rose are Rose in the first. La Rose are Rose. Yeah. That's, that, that's, yeah, La Rose are Rose is Eddie Constantine that yeah. passed by. Yeah. This is La Rose are Rose I knew. But uh, it's mostly asking all the people I knew to come for one day. And all these actors were very kind and generous to come. And Daniel Delorme and Yves Robert, yeah, about maybe not so well known for you, but they were very famous at the time. And Jean Claude Briali, Eddie Constantine, Sammy Frey, who okay. came? Um, well, Jean Luc and Anna, obviously. And they were lovely. They, they made it very nicely. They were nice to me. And, we did it in one day, fast, fast. And the producer is the one driving the corbillard, how do you say that? The, the hearse, the hearse, hearse. George broke out with his glasses. And who else? Well, you know, it was like having something that she, we could have relaxed. You know, the same way I did in Vagabond to have that scene with the old woman. I think we need a laugh here and there, you know, including in, in film that's serious or dealing with serious matters. I, I think it's very tiring to be oppressed all the time with something, or oppressed, or just being with it in a very serious and not serious. But it's not always boring. I mean, I try to make a lot of side things that people would smile and, or appreciate or whatever. But I wanted that, and then she goes down the step and breaks her mirror, and that was one of the superstitions. Yeah. Superstition. About it, you know, th not don't wear something new on Tuesday. If you break a mirror, you, it's bad luck. If you do this, and I think her maid and herself became very aware of don't put a hat in a bed. I had a list like this of superstition, and I thought. Since superstition is not serious and fear is serious, it's interesting to mix them. So you get a lot of side stupid fears, but they exist for people who believe that. Uh, for me, it was very clear that the film is black and white because at the time we didn't have the money for color. At that time, color was much more expensive than black and white, which is no longer true. Uh, I wanted the beginning to be what the storyteller sees According to you believe in it or not, it's fiction. For me, the cards, you know, what she sees in the cards, it's, I'm not a believer in cards, but some people do believe. She see, I see this, I see that. And, and the way she's very dramatic to her husband, which is hidden in the bathroom in the time, she has clients, you know, and she says, I saw the death, you know, and brings us in something that we don't know if we have to believe or not. But the cards are like the dreamy like, a dreamy life in which you don't or you believe or you don't have to believe. That was an idea I had, no specific explanation than just that. But it's only cards, money, you know. Money and only having it being able to do one piece in color? So no, it's not really about that, but I like the idea that that was something fake. That, and then, in a way, in that story, black and white became reality. Came like this. Uh, there was another question. Yeah, yeah, two, three. Oh. Uh, it's good for me that I don't go away saying, is that my subject, should I do something else? But it is true that it looks like negative, you know, that very blonde woman, Cleo, wondering, she's still afraid to die. And by the way, at the end, you don't know if you die or not. You notice that we did, you know, you like that the cancer is named only once. 
But the doctor says that she has two months of rayon, rays. Of, uh, no, uh, radiation. radiation. So we know it has to be cancer, the way. He says, okay, it's okay in two months, you don't know. In the English, you don't know, you know even less because it just says treatment, it doesn't say. It is three months of what? It just says treatment, it doesn't say radiation. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you know, the old subtitles were not too good. And some of our films of that time, I checked the subtitles now, we are more precise about these things. Uh, it's three, he said two months of rayon, oh, yeah. rays. Yeah. And it's clear that it's a cancer. Oh, so so bad that it could be a cancer, and we don't know if she will live or not. It's not the subject of the film, by the way. The subject is really that fear wakes her up, and at a time when maybe she has little time to come, and and with that man that she won't maybe see because he'll die maybe too also. So her wondering is because she waits for something. And it's all about her, she's there all the time, this is true. And we can say that it's a kind of negative and more desperate thing about Mona in Vagabond, because she's going around like this, and we know she's dead. She will die because we see her dead at the beginning. And she's also described by other people, you know, watching her, being witness of her life. There are two, this is true, there are two relationships between these two films separated 61 and 85. Mm. But no, Galinas is not wondering. I mean, I'm wondering, I like, every artist is wondering, getting things here and there, but Galinas is really about Galinas. And my position as a filmmaker, I establish more myself as a filmmaker than really being Galini, but making a documentary which is not objective, I totally accept that documentary is about reality, but it's seen by somebody. And uh, the filmmaker of a documentary can be hidden or can be exposed. And I thought it would be more honest to be exposed among the other people I expose in the film. But it's not exactly about wondering. But yes, it is true that I've made other films than those. Uh, as a subject, I mean, the happiness was about a couple and dealing very much with the man's position about freedom. I made other films. I mean, Kung Fu Master was a love story between a woman of 30 or 40 and a boy of 15. So I've been interested in, I must say, people being in danger or being slightly different or being side or being mar marginal or being different. I must say, like, I wouldn't do, though I think it's well done, but like films of Chabrol telling stories about the bourgeoisie and how rotten they are, or stories happening to them. I'm not interested, I mean, in terms of making films or writing about that. I'm really more interested in, in things that touch me because they're slightly off and society is not indulgent and not accepting and not understanding. I, I'm much more uh, un attracted by these stories or character or imagination of that people. So Cleo is a beautiful woman, but she's in danger, really. And being in danger for some different reasons, illness or special feelings, but I never touched and never did, and I don't think I will work on people being uh, uh, psych psychologically, uh, like, you know, crazy people. Or psychopaths. Psychopaths or being vaguely off or, uh, I don't know the name, autist and all that, which are very important subjects, but I'm not able to to approach that clearly or understand it. So there are many things I would never touch because I knew, oh, it disgusts me, like war film, you know. I, I wouldn't do it one, even to say that it's bad or good. I, would, I, I could not, or I don't know, or I enable. I'm totally out of a lot of subjects. So when you see connection between my films, well, there is one connection, I made them. 
I mean, in a way. But you don't see yourself as following themes. You know, it comes and it's clear after 40 years, more than 40 years, that some things come out clearly that at least I didn't do. Uh, no, you know, the soldier is, is in the Italian war, and many people, and among the soldiers, many soldiers, like many American soldiers, were not happy to be in Vietnam, eh? because they didn't believe the war they were acting in was good and reasonable. No war is good, but you know, it's more understandable if they come and kill your neighbor to fight the one who killed your neighbor. It's kind of understandable. But in these colonial wars, I mean, they were very against it. So they had the feeling that being afraid, which is normal, but being afraid to die for a bad cause, I would call, made the fear of death more accurate and more str and stronger. So that's how I think there are two relations, there are two loneliness, there are two lonely feelings, as I said before, can join because both of them, they, they are afraid of something they don't know and they don't agree and suddenly they feel that by that meeting in which there is a little a flirtation, a little storytelling, a little, he wants to amuse her and she's amused and, and she tells the truth and in a way they don't hide, you know, and this is so good, I guess, to feel that makes them feel something good and she's able to say, I feel maybe I'm not afraid and maybe I feel some happiness, which is some so odd. Just, you know, it's about time, it's also about some time in the time <laughs> that are so precious that suddenly something happens that makes that time more interesting than before and after. Moment, the moment de grâce, whatever you call that. And I thought it was important that we could feel sometimes the pressure of she feels that something bad. And then suddenly, it, just, it, it you know, I really felt like a um, metronome and violon, it's like a comparison that I use. Metronome is the thing to use, you know, the for piano, you know, we're learning music. This is, it, it's a beat, you know, it doesn't, you don't change the beat. But the violin player, I mean, sometimes you don't hear anymore any longer the, the metronome because I mean the, the melody takes you away or the way the sound is so nice that you are in the same room but you don't listen to the metronome anymore any longer. So I was trying to have that feeling that sometimes the clock could get you back that tick a tick a tick. This is you know which maybe tick a tick a tick and she may die. But in another hand because of some amount of grace and some feeling that something was going through, listening to another person or sharing, seeing or stopping or smiling, it could change that. And suddenly the sound of the violin could be better than the other sound. This is, this is not very logical. What I say, what I felt, that I wanted to, the film to give the impression. I think it gives it. Some moments you go with the film and sometimes you know that it's going back to 610, 620, and she missed. When she's ready not to meet the doctor, he appears. And uh, say, oh, I thought you were, and I hear and heard. And, uh, and because I was behind the door, I didn't want to open. I came the last five minutes, but I didn't want to open, because the light outside, this is a very strange thing, is automatic, so it doesn't uh, turn off. So I would have been a big light, and so I stayed, I heard. <laughs> the last words, because I always forget what I wrote. And I heard a thing about, oh, so I said, the thing about missing, which is very important in time, when you think you miss something and you don't miss it, but you miss it, you think you won't miss, and finally you miss. Or you know, you're on another, you take the door when it goes out and the other one comes in. And this is related to time, getting the thing in time or missing it. And Finally, she doesn't miss the doctor, and well, he, he makes a nice lie by saying he's a 
brother because we know that when you come in the world of hospital and medication and medic doctors, only the family has rights, which is stupid, you know. A friend could be more interested than your family, but that's the way it is. That's why he says he's the brother. He never said that to her. She doesn't react to that. She doesn't say anything. But because he's the brother, we'd be able to have news or the doctor would speak to him. So a lot of little quotation about being sick and the way things go. But the main thing for me was that because of that fear and, and, and her coquetry, she was escaping things that she slightly discovered in the second part of the film. And it makes her feel better. It's, it's, it's a good something. Doesn't tell much more than that. There was another question. Yes. I just wanted to say, um, and to thank you for all of us probably, as you were tracing the look and you said that there's a, a switch, you know, when she starts looking. But there are also something, it seemed to me like the limit of the visible or um, the dead look that began also with uh, the masks. So you don't know who's looking at whom when she sees the masks. I don't know if you remember that there are. But the cancer itself is um, at the limit of what can be seen. It's almost the anti-film in a sense that she, in other words, uh, she she keeps on saying that it can't be seen. It's it's what where the look <coughs> stops, right? There is no gaze except eventually, I suppose, the doctor said <coughs> some film to decide whether, even though it was a prélèvement as well. But the the way she carries the cancer and the the question of her beauty and health, to me, was like designating a limit of what can be seen. Or made available to the look, the gaze. Specifically. Because when she comes down from the storyteller, and she's one of these, I love this hold where there is mirror, both sides, so you see yourself like her, you know, in unlimited visions of herself. And she, she is very happy about her own beauty. And she sees, if she's beautiful, she's not sick. There is something very stupid about her. Like, as if her beauty could protect her. And what the film shows is that the beauty doesn't protect her. And the beauty obliged the other people to make her like a doll of herself, like a puppet of herself. And, and when she behaves with the Michel Lecan, who plays himself, you know, he plays the Michel Lecan. And the other day wants her to, she feels that they have a kind of contempt for her. Like, she's a beauty, but she's stupid. She's beautiful, but she cannot sing. She's beautiful, but she's not good. Th th there is a pressure like this. And it's well known that very beautiful women, there is a tendency to say that they're stupid. And, and there is like a social pressure about that, collective pressure. That's how, when they give her that song that it says that she'll be dead in a, in a Coffin. Coffin. Alone, you know, pale and livid and without you, without you. Maybe it's a song of, you know, desperate, no love, but she cannot take it. I mean, that's how she wakes up saying, hey, am I singing my own death when I'm so lonely? And, and suddenly, I, by being un angry, angry at those who make her be the puppet of her own fear, she wakes up, and I think she goes out, and she doesn't go with the maid. And in the another thing is in the cafe the dome, she puts herself her own her her own disc movie. At the time they were little. Mm, yes. But this was on forty-two. What was forty-two? Yeah. And nobody listened to her to her song, and nobody listened. But she looks at all these people, all these artists, all these strange people looking at her. And I think she sees the people. She doesn't now. She no longer exactly believes they should listen to her song, but she sees them as existing, as existing person. And we all have, early or not early in our life, that suddenly very strong perception that other people exist 
each of them with their own face, their, their own look, their own way of speaking, etc. I think that's a very simple discovery, but she does it that day. She could have done it before, but that day, because of that, because she comes out, out of her mind, and, and suddenly she sees that they don't listen to her and they exist. And it's a very, I would say, existentialist perception of her own body also existing and being in danger. And then it enlight, enlightens, come on. Mm. Something comes that she doesn't feel so much the fear. She's not so afraid. Maybe when he has, she has taken him to the train and he's gone and she goes home, it would be a disaster. You don't know, you know, like, it's what it is. But the film is a film and it stops at that precise moment. Pardon? I didn't choose to have a fake pomp funèbre, which is a, a shop of, you know, business of death, you know. Understood. It's because when you are impressed by something, you see it. You know, if somebody has been taken in an ambulance that very day, you will hear ambulances all over. And I don't think that day there are more than another day. But you listen to that. If somebody offers you a nice ring, you will look at other women hands. If you have something upsetting you, you'll see. I was impressed that the real way of Cleo, because she has to go from Parc Montsouris to the hospital, she takes the right bus to go there. These shops were there, like one which is called Bonne Santé when she comes out of her house, or Pompe Funèbre. I didn't make them up. Obviously, I, I slowed down in a way. I took advantage of that, but not that I had to obey reality. I could have done fake shops, but I believe very much that when you're upset about something, it, it comes to you. So I thought, well, there are enough in the way we, in the real trip. So it's true that I remember seeing a baby like this in a couveuse, as I said, it's when, they are, when they, they are born too early, you know, to keep them like this for a time, maybe one month or something. And I remember in the street seeing that, and I put it in the film, because for me it's in relation with when she said about the coughing about herself, on me mettra en terre, seul, seul lait de livide, when she sings that song, there is something about incubated, which also is like a coughing in a way. But it's, it's like a positive side of of a coughing, because babies are there to be more alive, to, to be saved, you know. It's, you can see it also that they save them. Also, there is, sp sp speaking about Snow White, which is interesting, who got woken up by love. So, but that was also. Yes. The dance. Cercueil de verre. You know, my, no, I no, think he's... The poor dame that I discussed, you know, when Jack made the, the, the dead queen dies, she has a round coffin with a globe, transparent, that you can see her. There is like a, a, a lot of allegory and myth and stories about seeing through and being exposed. I mean, I, I, don't, I cannot explain it very precisely, but these images came because I remember having seen that, I thought, would nice. There is a clinic there on the real way of the 67 bus. And it was a real clinic, I said, well, here we did ask to have an incubator passing by. Well, obviously it's a film, it's a fiction film, we organize things. But the real thing I noticed was that when you're upset about something, you read a lot of signs responding to your obsession. And I would imagine that day she would see herself by herself, bonne santé, pompe funèbre, all this will aggress her eyes when it was there before, maybe, and she never noticed it. And, you know, these uh, cars transporting flowers to deliver flowers, for me, I don't remember it was a something. I think just a, a bunch of flowers, delivering a bunch of flowers. Crosses, they come from the Les Halles, you know, they go to get, maybe, and so it picks one gives her. But maybe it could be what you say. It can't be read like this. Like there was a woman passing by also, very pregnant. I remember, they was passing by there, and I said, I said, oh, get her, let her have her when she passes by. So she passed by, and I remember we offered her, we buy her, 
brought her some flowers, gave her two minutes after. So sometimes we're grabbing people passing by mm -hmm. like this. Maybe it, somebody would say, oh, does it has the meaning? If she dies, she won't get a child. Maybe not. It just happened that a woman was there and thought, all images of life are good, and grab that woman.